a very warm welcome to the Oxford Martin School. Thank you for braving the rain to, to get here. And i um, really delighted to see you. I know it's a very, very busy time of year with exams uh, and so forth going on. And particularly delighted to welcome three good friends uh, to, to the stage with me, uh, who collectively I've known for a very long time. Um, I think uh, Hirinda was probably the person I met first, Hirinda Kohli, who was the big boss, uh, my boss's boss when I was at the World Bank for the first time. Uh, and then I also met Montek, uh, who was uh, then running the Independent Evaluation Office at the IMF uh, and Zuma a little bit later when you used to come to annual meetings and things uh, and in detail uh, more broadly. So I'm Ian Golden uh, and I'm the professor of globalization and development at Oxford and was the founding director of the Oxford Martin School. I'm going to introduce briefly our very distinguished uh, guests, but I won't spend long on their bios because if I did, there would be absolutely no time uh, for uh, any conversation. Uh, and I think you also know of them, which is why you, you're here. Um, starting with, with Montek uh, on my right, Montek Singh Alawalia, currently Distinguished Fellow at the Center for Social and Economic Policy. Uh, he was the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission of India uh, over a 10-year period, having a really fundamental impact on the evolution of economic policy, uh, and some very, very significant achievements during that period uh, in, at the national level. In India, he was the first director of the Independent Evaluation Office at the IMF, and I know too there he had a very fundamental impact. My friends in the IMF used to quake when they were told that he would be looking at their work because it was a source of great integrity uh, and analysis on how the IMF was doing uh, that remained steadfastly independent. Uh, he's played a role in many different places in the Indian government, in economic policy, economic advisory policy, uh, at the World Bank. He was head of the income division and he comes back to Oxford as an Oxford alum, having done an MPhil here, uh, an undergrad, and indeed knows this building from way before I, I, I ever stepped foot in. So delighted to have you back in. In, in Oxford and in this building, uh, Montech. Uh, Harinda Kohli, uh, in addition to having been the director of the Maghreb region when I was a youngster, sled hair on my head, I think then, uh, at, at the, the World Bank, is now the chief executive and founding director of the Emerging Markets Forum. He's also the founding director of the Sentinel Group, um, which is a private uh, consulting group. He's the founding editor of the Global Journal of Emerging Market Economies, uh, and he's the author of many books and has been a real force for progressive change analysis and clear thinking in the Washington community, especially at the World Bank, but much more widely uh, subsequently. Uh, and one of those people that really understands development uh, analytically, globally, uh, and knows more people uh, in more places in developing countries than I could ever begin <laughs> to imagine. Uh, Suma Chakrabarti, so Suma Chakrabarti uh, was the permanent secretary in the department, uh, was it still called DFID then? For, for international <laughs> development, um, when then became the permanent secretary in the Department of Justice, uh, then became the president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development for 10 years, uh, and now does many things, including being the chair of the Overseas Development uh, Institute uh, board. Uh, again, the combination of these three people, I think there's nothing happening and no one in, of the significance in development that the three of them uh, do not in, connect to in some way. But they're here not to talk about all of that, that but rather about this extraordinary new book, Envisaging 2060, uh, which is a very courageous attempt to think about the future over a very long period of time uh, of development and of emerging markets. This is something which many people 
have thought about doing, but I don't know anyone that's actually succeeded um, in this way. Uh, extraordinary brave attempt, 19 chapters, which look at different aspects of this future. And what they're gonna present to you today uh, is some nuggets of wisdom, some overview of this. And uh, you are very fortunate as well that uh, they've kindly provided, I think there may be 39 copies left because I've stolen one, um, copies of the book at the back of the room, which you're welcome to pick up and take uh, as you leave. So um, they're there at the back of the room. If we run out of copies, um, Harinda's very kindly offered to send some more. So if you could give your address to Elizabeth, who's at the back of the room, um, we will make sure that you get a copy if there are none left after that. So thanks so much for coming and spending this time with us. Thank you for giving us the copies of the book. Um, and most of all, thank you for what you've done in your lives uh, for development and for people around the world. Arunda, do you want to spend 10 minutes describing what this book's about, why you did it, and what it's about? Sure. Um, Ian, thank you very much. Thank you for hosting this um, event. It's a pleasure to be at Oxford Margin School and with two good friends. Um, um, first, let me say the book went to the press before these tragic events in Ukraine. So the book doesn't take into account uh, these events and the major impact these recent geopolitical events will have. Uh, so keep that in mind. I should also say that the book is, um, is a result of efforts by 20 authors from around the world. And we are three of those 20 authors. Um, I hope you'll take the time to read the book. And the copies, as Ian mentioned, are behind you and those of you who haven't yet picked the book copies of the books please take them home and if there are not enough copies as he has mentioned we'll be happy to send you copies now the book is almost 500 pages long um ian has suggested that i take about 10 minutes uh, so in those 10 minutes as you can imagine it's impossible to summarize them um, what we'll do is I'll give you a brief glimpse of what the book is about. And then um, Montek and Sasuma will discuss with you two of the chapters in the book. One on climate change, what emerging markets as a group uh, can and could do, should do. And Sasuma will discuss the state of global governance and how the multilateral system should be improved to tackle some of the big issues in the world. But um, I like to make five quick points about the book. The first, the book highlights how, in our view, the post-pandemic world will be quite different compared to where we were in 2019. And the world will be different in our view, not because of just the impact of the pandemic. In our view, the world will be different because of the changes um, which are already underway. And what the pandemic has done is revealed in much sharper relief the underlying changes which are underway. And some of the changes have been accelerated because of the pandemic. Um, some of the underlying trends, which have accelerated, which has been brought into sharper relief, uh, I just want to give you three examples. And the book describes a number of other changes. First, there was already quite a lot of dissatisfaction with globalization. And that dissatisfaction has been brought to fore in a much bigger way. What happened with the distribution of the vaccinations? Just an example. Um, there is already a trend for nationalism to onshore production of goods and services. Um, the spread of, if you would, 
um, Trumpism. The acceleration of trends for the extreme right in France, Brexit. These are just examples with dissatisfaction with globalization. Another example is the dissatisfaction with the traditional political parties. Excuse me. I should have done it before the end. Excuse me. The dissatisfaction with the political, traditional political parties, with the governance system, uh, etc. And Satsuma, I think, will touch on the, the problem with the governance. The third is the dissatisfaction with the existing multilateral system. How, in the view of many people, the existing multilateral institutions are not effective anymore in addressing the big issues in the world, climate change, inequality, etc. And he will talk about that a little bit. I can give you many more examples. So that's one thing that the book talks about, how the post-pandemic world will not be the same as it was three, four, five years ago. Second, the book takes a look at the longer term opportunities and risks facing the emerging markets. It doesn't talk about the short term issues, the longer term perspective. And let's you imagine how the world could look like in year 2060. Your world, I'm so glad there's so many young faces here, but also the world that your children, your grandchildren even, will be facing. And in looking at that, it starts by a discussion of 10 global megatrends, which will drive most of the world, particularly the emerging markets, and goes on to discuss some of the major issues, uh, including uh, things like uh, demographics, how the global, the world as a whole, except for Africa, is going to age, and we may even see declining populations in more and more countries. But then it talks about things like inequality, governance of countries, how it is deteriorating, not improving as it should, um, climate change, productivity, and then agriculture, your field, before you started rocketing up the world. We work together on agriculture issues at Margaret, for example. But then it also drills down on prospects of three important regions of the world, Africa, Latin America, and Asia, and contrasts the three. So those kind of issues it discusses, and then it develops scenarios of the world, various scenarios, how the trajectory of the world as a whole could evolve, depending on different assumptions. Third, overall, based on this analysis, our view is there is a possibility that we could have fairly optimistic prospects for the world, provided some of the big issues that we discussed are tack tackled effectively. Let me paint you a picture. Under the optimistic scenario, the most optimistic scenario that we build, it is quite possible, not guaranteed, we can't take it for granted, but if all goes well, relatively well, we could see the prospects that roughly 6 billion people of the world, out of 9.5 billion people in the world, 6 billion people, which will be all of North America, Europe, including developing parts of Europe, Eastern Europe, and much of East Asia, could have living standards equal to or better than southern Europe today. By that I mean Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece. These six billion people could have living standards, you'll be quite well off. As a result, some 60 countries in the world could be classified as advanced countries as defined by OECD today. But even under this desired objective scenario, we would still have three regions of the world, Africa, Latin America, and Middle East, who will be relatively stagnant. So even under this benign scenario, we could see two worlds, a prosperous 
thriving, well off six billion people and four billion people who may be living in stagnant, not so well off region, particularly Africa. Therefore, I urge you to read the chapters, not only about Asia, which is quite optimistic, and Africa and Latin America, which makes you worried. But there is a pessimistic scenario. And that pessimistic scenario says the per capita income of the world as a whole could be just one third. And the reason is the compounding problem. Those of you who study math or economics can see compounding can be quite a problematic issue. If you compound things over 30 years, the numbers can be dramatically lower. Now, my next point is that there are three basic issues. There are a lot of issues in the book, but three basic issues which will determine which of the two extreme scenarios will come to pass. Though the reality is, the probability is that the actual scenario which comes to pass will be somewhere in between the two extremes. So what are the three big issues? The most important issue which needs to be tackled is climate change. How effectively the world as a whole and individual countries, the big countries tackle climate change will have a big impact. And therefore, Monte Carlo Valle will talk about it. Second is inequality. The fact is, in the last 15 years or so, inequality within countries has been rising, despite everybody's effort. There's a big economic issue. There's a chapter in the book about it. But it's also big political and social issues. If inequality is kept on rising, then the world could explode. That issue must be tackled. And third, on which Ian had just written publishing a paper, is productivity. Productivity at the global level and productivity at the national level. The big difference between the optimistic scenario and the pessimistic scenario is, would the world be able to manage the technology change and improve productivity? If that issue is not tackled, then we are unlikely to reach the potential that the world has between us. Now, I'm quite worried. I'm normally an optimistic person. I'm quite worried about what will happen to Africa and what will happen to Latin America and the Middle East, the three commodity exporting regions. Let me stop there. And I think we should now go on to one thing. Thank yeah, you back so to much, you. Uh, Farinda. And thanks so much for sticking to your time too. Just uh, for your information, if you could hold your questions uh, till the end, we will have an opportunity for Q&A. And also, I should have greeted people that are online. We, I know we have a large online contingent. And you'll also be able to submit your questions online. Uh, I have an iPad where they will appear. Um, so um, do hold your questions, and we'll have an opportunity for that afterwards. But thank you so much. Um, uh, over to you, Monty. Can I go to the lecture? Yes, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I just can't resist going to a lectern in a university. I mean, you know. uh, thank you. Uh, great pleasure to be here. You know, uh, we're under a very tight time constraint, and Ian has told me that he will frantically wave his arms when I get too close to the limit, so I encourage you to do that. Um, Harinda has summarized the book quite admirably in 10 minutes. I have to summarize only one chapter in 10 minutes. That should be easier. But the, I just want to make five points, and I leave it to you to look at the chapter itself uh, to elaborate, if you want any of these things elaborated. And the most important point is that uh, COP26 in Glasgow uh, was a very important turning point. I mean, the negotiations on climate change have been going on since 1992, and they progressed in a very steady kind of way. Uh, and in the early days, the perception of the whole world was that the um, obligations to reduce uh, uh, emissions should be largely on the developed world and the developing world got a kind of pass. And that attitude clearly changed over time. But developing countries were quite unwilling to accept any obligation to actually reduce emissions. 
I mean, the most they were willing to promise was that they would reduce the emissions intensity of GDP, which is good, but it doesn't reduce emissions if GDP is going to expand. So it was really in COP26 that all developing countries for the first time ever actually agreed that they will bring CO2 emissions down to zero at different times in mid-century. So this is one point, a very important point, and there are issues about how difficult it will be for them to do it. Uh, but I think the second point that I want to touch upon is that while one can congratulate oneself uh, on this, uh, you have to remember that if you ask the question, are the commitments of all countries adequate or not? And the short answer is they're not. I mean, the work of the IPCC led to uh, a general agreement that the earlier uh, Paris Agreement range of tolerable global warming, which was between 1.5, 2 degrees, less than 2 degrees C, and ideally 1.5 degrees C, this range is unacceptable. It should be 1.5 degrees C and no more. So this was an important change. And I mean, it may look a very small change, but the fact is that all the work done, and some of this is summarized in the chapter, the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees C is very large. And you're talking about uh, effects on agricultural productivity, very bad effects in Africa, also in East Asia, um, migration, people being displaced, something of the order of more than 100 million people may have to move. And this can create incredible uh, both distress and social uh, dislocation. So we need to get to 1.5. In Paris, the commitments made in Paris were uh, once they were made and everybody had stopped congratulating themselves on this incredible breakthrough, uh, people said, well, you know, this is good, but uh, the global warming, if everybody does what they promised, will be 2.8 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So we were very far uh, in Paris, off the mark. We talked then about 1.5. What has, what has COP26 uh, assure us if everybody does what they said they were going to do. Well, what it assures us is that it might be around 2.4. So that's, that's a sense uh, of inadequacy. Having said that, uh, there are two other issues that one should address. One is, can the developing countries actually reduce their emissions down to zero? I think there the good news is the consensus today is that it can be done it will actually involve humongous changes in virtually all sectors of the economy. I think in the, your lobby downstairs, there's some very nice stuff on the wall, which tells you what are the things you have to do, and they're all correct. I mean, the biggest change has to be in converting the generation of uh, power, electricity, away from fossil fuel-based uh, generation to renewables and the technology now exists to make that possible and many developing countries including india are actually putting in a lot of re capacity and it seems to be working quite well uh, in addition to that you need to substitute for fossil fuel use wherever it's being used and can be substituted by electricity i mean clearly the transport sector is the most obvious and there also things are happening. Developing countries are in fact bringing in electrifying, electrification of vehicles, et cetera. But you know, these changes are not just uh, little news items that the first electric vehicle or electric bus or something has uh, been either sold or started uh, to move around in New Delhi or in Jakarta or something. You're really talking about humongous changes in the structure of the economy. I mean, let me just give one example. If the idea is to cut uh, CO2 emissions from transport to zero by moving to electricity, clearly a related part of that is the electricity shouldn't be generating CO2 emissions. So we keep that separate. But just, just making the change in electric vehicles, I mean, that would require 100% of the vehicle fleet to become electric. The present position, if you want good news, is that electric vehicles are being sold. But just to take uh, one country as an example, India, 
I mean, the total number of electric vehicles sold is about 2% of the total electric vehicles sold. So the first task is to go from 2 to 100% of all the new vehicles. And if the whole fleet has to be made electric, let's say by 2050, and if you assume that in any developing country, cars will be around for 20 years before they're junked, then really by 2030, 100% of all vehicles sold should actually be electric. So going from 2022 to 2030 gives the automobile sector about eight years to convert to a 100% electric fleet. It's a humongous change. They will do it. They will, they will do a lot. They will certainly go above 2%, but whether they'll reach 100% or not is, is a big question. I can replicate this example everywhere. Uh, for example, uh, one of the big things is one of the, one of the structural changes identified in this book is that urbanization is going to become very important. So urbanization is going to become very important in a country like India, which has been slow to urbanize. The magnitude of what is involved is that the, let's say the urban population in maybe 2011 was about 370 million people. And by 2050, they expect it to be 800 million people. Now that is going to involve a huge number of buildings and so on uh, being constructed to accommodate them. They'll all be higher income levels, so they'll all want cooling. And so there's a nice little, one of the things you have in your foyer is the, the problem of uh, cooling and the warming, global warming it causes. We need to have buildings that are designed in such a way to reduce the cooling load. And of course, you need to have much more efficient air conditioning systems. And I think what many people have pointed out is that uh, one way of looking at it is that India and other developing countries have an opportunity to, uh, as it were, leap over, leapfrog uh, over periods that other countries have gone to, because the infrastructure needed doesn't actually exist as yet. But on the other hand, making these changes is not very easy. So I wouldn't go on and on about, but the, what comes out of this is it's possible if you intervene in a large number of areas, if you intervene with multiple instruments, and the government levels that have to do the intervention are not just the national government, but also at the state level, which is say the province level, and at the local level. And all of this has to pull together. And that is quite a humongous uh, piece of coordination that the governments have to do. And all this has to be done in a political environment where many of the things that need to be done are going to be politically difficult. I mean, the most obvious, if you really want to conserve energy, prices have to play a big role. And unfortunately, the political economy of energy pricing is that governments gain political mileage by saying we're keeping energy prices low. Uh, can we give that up completely and sort of basically say that, look, prices have to reflect uh, social costs and social benefits. Related to this is the issue of carbon price, uh, uh, carbon taxation. It's there on the agenda. Nobody's actually done it. But, you know, the International Monetary Fund has said that a, a progressive way of achieving uh, carbon pricing would be for the industrialized countries to put in a par carbon price at whatever, $75 per ton or $50 per ton, and India to do it at $25 per ton. Now, if we had such a consensus, global consensus, that the developing countries would pay more uh, of a price for carbon and the developed, I mean, so developed countries will pay more, the developing countries less, there is a chance of getting something like that put in place. But, you know, no developed country, uh, I know that in Europe they do have sort of uh, uh, an internal market that is being created, but it's yet a new thing, not yet firmly established. So we're really starting. I mean, I'm running out of time, so I, I'm going to skip the stuff on finance by just mentioning one thing. It is, it requires a tremendous change, uh, and there's a lot of work done. Uh, what is the investment consequence of this change? Uh, and how much of this investment is additional? 
not easy to determine what's actually additional. I mean, just to ex give an example, uh, you may say, for example, that you certainly have to get rid of uh, coal-fired power, power generation and move to renewables. And therefore, you need so much more gigawattage of renewables. But that's not actually additional. What is additional is what would that cost compared to doing the same thing with the traditional ways of doing it. And even that's not complete because if you were relying on power based on coal, then you would also be investing in coal mines uh, and in expanding coal production. Whereas if you go to renewables, you're not doing that. So it's not easy to work out what is uh, the real additional burden. But Nick Stern and some of his colleagues in the London School have done a lot of work on this. And just to give you one number, you know, up to now, the global negotiations have proceeded on the assumption that the developed countries will assist developing countries to make the transition with some agreed amount of assistance. So far, the discussion has been on $100 billion per year to be reached by 2020, which hasn't been reached. And I think the Glasgow Pact says, well, maybe we get there by 2024. Against this, what Nick and company say is that we need $1.3 trillion by 2025 and $3.5 trillion by 2030, of which they say half should come from the developing countries themselves. But that would still leave external assistance of the order of $650 billion by 2025 and 1. $1.8 something billion by 2030. And this is the amount compared to a base level that we haven't got to 100 yet. So uh, it's very easy to throw up one's hands and say, well, it's not going to happen. On the other hand, there's a lot of work done, and I won't elaborate on it. If there was a multilateral consensus that actually said that what is at stake is actually saving the planet, it's not just the development of some poor countries, it's a global phenomenon, then the scale of what is being demanded is not impossible. A lot of it will be private investment, but in order to get private investment, you need probably a lot of multilateral lending to create conditions that would reassure private sector people. All this is floating around in the air, and it's all meant to be discussed in COP27 in November. But then, as Harinda said, all these ideas predate uh, Russia and Ukraine. So how much mind space there will be this year to address these issues is an open question. But you know, on the assumption that, let's say, by this time next year, some of the problems on Russia, Ukraine, some of the problems on the pandemic may appear to be receding, these are huge challenges that are waiting to be taken up. And they're going to take a lot of time. but people better start thinking about it in advance. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much, uh, Montek. And um, you've certainly highlighted the urgency and the scale uh, of what's needed. And um, I'm sure we'll come back to many of these questions in, in the discussion which will follow this. Uh, Sir Suma, uh, your chapters on multilateralism and uh, where it fits in and how it's doing. Let's start with the problems <laughs> and hopefully then move very quickly to the solutions. What are the principal issues affecting the multilateral system? Thanks, Ian, and thanks for hosting us here at uh, this wonderful old building where Montek and my father both studied, actually, uh, years ago. And, and thanks for bringing the diversity to this panel. Uh, probably the first and last time I'll ever say that about you. I think it's, it's the first time I ever qualified. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think um, you know, we, all three of us, all four of us, in fact, have worked in the multilateral system. And by the multilateral system, in my chapter, I'm essentially talking about the multilateral development banks, uh, first created uh, just at the end of the Second World War with Bretton Woods, uh, with the World Bank and IMF at that time, but then subsequently all these regional banks. So you had the Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, and of course also the one I led, uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And I'm saying essentially, that these banks, for a long period, I think were very much in sync with the needs, the uh, demands of the emerging markets developing uh, economies, and actually were quite instrumental, I think, 
in their growth uh, over those many decades. But I would posit in my chapter that that has changed. And that's changed quite fundamentally, I think, in the last few years. Um, and, you know, I, I've grown up. I was the president of one of those banks during those last few years. But I, I would say in my, our chapter, what we try to do is we show a, a range of the issues that Harinder and Montek mentioned. Inequality, climate change, jobs, uh, technology, productivity. And show that actually what the offer is from these multilateral development banks is no longer quite in sync with what the problems are in these countries. Uh, and I would argue that one of the reasons is that the development lobbies, including ones from Oxford, uh, which uh, push the agenda uh, of the advanced economy shareholders of these banks, are not as interested in these issues. So, uh, and some of these issues are quite difficult to tackle. So the banks have become, for example, an inequality, growing inequality since the mid 1980s, not bad at uh, tackling things like inclusion. So for my own bank, uh, EBID, developed programs on uh, uh, finance for female entrepreneurs and so on. So aspects of inclusion have become better at. But meanwhile, inequality, as measured by Gini coefficients on, has worsened in many of these places. And the banks are not really focusing on these issues. Climate is a good example of that. Um, Montek, at the end of his 10 minutes, spoke about the climate finance needs. If you look at what the, uh, these banks have been doing, yes, they've scaled up a bit. There's no doubt about that. But compared with those numbers, nowhere near. And they have the capacity to do so because they have enormous financial leverage, capital adequacy leverage. They could do that. But they're not at the races yet on that. And I could say the same about jobs, technology, productivity, where actually there's been some very good analysis in the policy parts of those banks. But if you look at their lending programs, they're doing very little in that area at all. So that's the basic thing. I think what that suggests to me is a loss of legitimacy to some extent in the eyes of the emerging markets about what these banks are doing. And it's led to issues around, you know, the transaction costs of working with these banks, very high, or the voice of the emerging markets. If you look at the shareholding structures, they're not, they're still sort of 1944 shareholder structures with some, some changes, but at the margin and not really reflecting uh, the weight, the economic, growing economic weight of the emerging markets in the global economy. And I think that's led also to the creation of new institutions where they have their voice. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank based in Beijing, the New Development Bank based in Shanghai. These are institutions where the emerging markets actually have a majority of the shareholding. Uh, I don't actually think that either of those two banks are working very well in terms of impact, but they clearly have the, the voice uh, they've answered the voice issue in, in a way. So that's, I think that's what's happening to the market. And I think this is uh, now exacerbated, as you rightly said, we all wrote our chapters before what's happened with Russia, Ukraine. We wrote our chapter, my chapter was written even before the failure of the vaccine rollout was seen. Um, and that's another strike against the multilateral system, uh, failure to get vaccines into sub-Saharan Africa and other places. But also then what happened over the Russia-Ukraine uh, the invasion of Ukraine, and essentially um, a splitting apart, a segmentation, I think, in the way shareholders in those institutions are behaving. And it's led to Janet Yellen's speech at the Atlantic Council a few weeks ago, Treasury Secretary, US Treasury Secretary, talking about the need to build a multilateral system based on shared values. Uh, well, you're all from Oxford, and I was taught always at Oxford to when I had to answer any essay question, who chooses and by what criteria? So who chooses what the right values are? And by what criteria do they choose? I think it's an impossible question to answer. So shared interests are more, I think, the way of thinking about multilateral organizations rather than shared values. But it is creating a moment where I think there's a splitting apart in what we want from these institutions, which I think was happening in the trends. But I think this Ukraine situation is creating a further dynamic which is segmenting the market. So that's basically the thesis. And if you were the, um, the foreign uh, minister or the treasury minister responsible for UK policy on this, what would your two recommendations be to fix it? Well, I'd, show, I'd first of all show some leadership. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and that leadership isn't the new British development strategy, uh, which basically says 
okay, we go for a bilateral approach to development assistance. So uh, the UK share of multilateral financing uh, in its development assistance budget is now going to fall to less than a quarter uh, in a couple of years' time. And at one point, when I was heading DFID, it was about two thirds was multilateral. So it's been a long, slow decline, but now a very sharp accelerated decline. Uh, Good luck spending that money well, because frankly, they've cut the staff staffing as well. So I don't see how bilateral aid is going to be effective. It would have been much more effective for more money into multilateral systems. Second thing I think that leadership should do, though, is actually, and we say this in the book, is try to work with a Janet Yellen, because I think she is a very rational, good observer of the international system to say, can we try and build a, a shared interest system? Bretton Woods 2.0, I think we say in the book that would actually try and work out what we can use these multilateral institutions for, which would be in the shared interest. I think climate fits that bill completely. So the climate financing thing, I think it would really fit that bill. We've got other special purpose institutions now for other areas, vaccines and other vaccine lines. But I think the World Bank, the Regional Development Bank should really be focusing on the green agenda uh, much more so. so but that would require, I think, G20 to come together to do that. So that. You, you're not saying that you think we need new global institutions like on climate, but rather that we can use the existing ones to, to solve our problems if we manage them right? We've got plenty of resources, human and capital, in these institutions. What we haven't got is a shared sense of leadership for what they should do. And I think we don't need to create any more new institutions. We've got plenty of institutions which play a useful part, but I think we really need to use the existing ones much better for this and refocus them. You wanted to come in on this one thing? Yes. something you touched upon in the paper. You know, the uh, climate finance negotiations began as a kind of a separate world uh, with a pretty low opinion of the World Bank and the IMF and so on. These were the good guys. And if you look at the UNF, Triple C, etc., the entire focus was that climate finance should be channeled through new institutions. So something called the Climate Fund or whatever was set up under the UN. But you know, this was a very really small institution. I think a total capital of about $10 billion to be spent over a few years. One of the points that we make, uh, and, the, and the, the trouble is these negotiations are conducted by ministries that originally shaped and determined what the UNFCCC would be. So deep in the psyche of people negotiating the climate change agreements is the notion that it shouldn't be through the multilateral development banks, it should be through a new UN, more democratic agency. But the fact is that you can do that, but you don't get much money. And where the money is, is really in these institutions, although that's also now the strength of commitment is going down. So what we do say in the paper is that uh, the, if developing countries and developed countries see that there is a global commonality of interest. I mean, this is very important because development finance is, uh, has a kind of global community of interest, but it's mainly something that will help developing countries and indirectly help the rest of the world. Climate finance is something which is really addressing uh, the creation of a global public good and the scale of resources required meant that action should shift from the COP uh, discussions to, we had thought the G20, because that was at that time, the principal agency for uh, non-security related uh, collaboration. Uh, we have problems there because of Russia, Ukraine, walkouts, et cetera. I don't know how long that will take to sort out. But you know, our view was that uh, this year, the Indonesians are chair of the G20, Next year, the Indians are chair of the G20, and the year after that, the Brazilians will chair the G20. So you've got three major emerging market countries in a position to set the agenda of the G20. And this is the group that really make, can make decisions on financing. So what we had said was that this whole thing should be shifted into this forum. Now, how easily that can be done in the light of Russia, Ukraine, Clearly, you have to rethink. But it certainly should be on the agenda also of the G7. We're not members of the G7, uh, although we get invited to these meetings. But it will be interesting to see whether some change of signal will come from here. I mean, what Suma said, 
that the British strategy uh, cuts out multilateral uh, lending and increases the bilateral, okay? Quite apart from how effectively that money can be spent. See, the great advantage of contributing to the multilateral agencies is they can leverage the resources. They don't leverage it as much as they could. So I think with a bit of imaginative financial engineering, the leveraging could be increased from two and three to even 10. But from the bilateral window, there's no leveraging. I mean, you give some aid and then it's gone. Unless the British want to, uh, and the others also, set up a, a separate development financing agency which they fund, which agency then borrows, uh, which would be borrowing on the credit of the British UK government and thus maximize uh, the flow. I think we, one thing is very clear, if we stick, if we stick with the institutions as they are, there's really only one uh, sensible choice that needs to be considered, which I think is what Suma also hinted at, that maybe the multilateral development banks have to be told that, look, all your lending should be climate finance related. Now, obviously, if you've given loans for health and uh, agriculture and what have you, which are being disbursed, you finish that. But no new lending in these areas. Is anyone willing to do that? I don't know. Uh, but that's the only I, I, way you can I, get I, along. I At BBRD, um, when I was there, we moved the target from 25% had to be climate financing to 50% by the time I left. And it was actually quite a lot of the opposition was internal amongst my staff because this meant they would have to change the products that were offer, on offer uh, and be a bit more creative mm. in thinking about it through. Um, and we had some opposition from some of the uh, shareholders to that. But they've achieved it, I gather. Yeah, so, so it is the issue will come up even amongst the developing countries yeah. because they will interpret the COP correctly. The COP promise was additional. Yeah. yeah. So anything that's a shift is not actually additional. Yeah. But if climate change finance is important, well, I mean, you know, maybe but it should let, be done. Let me just challenge you on that, Narendra. <laughs> um, <laughs> both, both because of the additionality point, which is it's that but also because development is not only about climate for, for many countries, particularly low-income countries, who, who contribute a tiny, tiny fraction of global emissions and will do for the next 20 years. Um, New York State it's, it has more greenhouse gas emissions than 43 countries in Africa put together. But um, so they, they're a tiny part of the problem. Whatever they do on the transition is not going to make a very, a very significant Dent on the global need for transition. And they have many, many other priorities, including, for example, getting people to school, getting clean water, feeding their people, building infrastructure, etc. You wouldn't say for them that they need to only have climate finance, surely. No, you can look, small and very poor countries do deserve separate consideration. But my guess is that if you were to separate that and say for the weakest of the emerging developing countries, uh, we have to continue the way we are doing. Then it would be a bit like what Suma said, instead of 100% of your lending becoming climate finance, you would increase it from whatever it is to something very substantial. But it would mean that for countries like India, Indonesia, Brazil, etc., the only finance they get would be for climate change. That would be, that would run into opposition too. For middle income. Yeah. From them, I mean, yeah. You know. yeah, yeah. So yeah. No, I think for middle-income countries, I can see yeah. the logic. But so not that's not. where the bulk yeah. of the yeah. Uh, yeah. So Correct. you could think of a model under which bilateral assistance could be directed to Africa. Let me just build a caricature. So you could channel the U.S. and European bilateral assistance to Africa more or less exclusively, and you can add Afghanistan, et cetera, to that. And you can say multilateral institutions, 90% of that, take a number, should be channeled primarily, exclusively for climate change. Even for the African Development Bank? Yes. And the reason is this, Montek mentioned, Suma mentioned, because of leveraging. Leveraging in a number of ways. First, leveraging of their capital, very important. 
But secondly, Montag mentioned, you use their policy heft to leverage their policy have their human resources, their experience to get policy changes in the countries because that's the only way private sector will come in. That's very important to prime the pump. And that's how you get IFC, you, you get other private sector arms of these institutions. Without that, the numbers that Nick Stern and colleagues are putting on the table will not be achieved. That you can't get through bilateral aid. Yes, but there also, anyway, we shouldn't dominate because I need, I need to open the floor. There's also a whole lot of other numbers that are on the table, like how many girls need to get to school, um, how many people need to get water and so on. There, India's and China's can handle that no, domestically, no, African, Africa not. That's yeah, why I started with bilateral aid. There's not enough bilateral. The multilaterals need to lead in that as well. Anyway, I don't want to dominate <laughs> with this discussion as important as it. Let's open it up. I'll look online to see what the questions are, but who would like to pose a question? Yeah, Elizabeth in the back of the room has a microphone. We do need to use the microphone because this is being recorded and relayed to those um, that are online. Let's start with the person closest to you, Elizabeth. Hi, um, my name is Avir. I'm a DPhil student at Oxford Department for International Development. Um, I also run a policy platform in Bangladesh with young people. So my question is, uh, in uh, I think 2017 or 18, EBRD came up uh, with annual report on middle income trap. And my research is focused on that. So the whole discussion on climate change and does it make uh, escaping the middle income trap more difficult for late, late developers? Uh, for example, if we talk about countries like India and also now Bangladesh, which is a lower middle income country, and uh, does it pose a dilemma uh, for policymakers uh, who have an election cycle to decide on which one to prioritize? And so, yeah, just wanted to take the view of the panel on that. Okay. If you don't have a particular person you want to pose to, um, it's fine to pose the panel and I'll leave it to them to pick up. Let's just gather a few questions if we can. Um, yes, the person along there, yeah. Um, good afternoon, I'm Peter Hinton. I'm a DPhil student uh, looking at uh, finance for education in Africa. I teach uh, on impact investing at the Business School. I want to go back to Stefan Durkon, who um, launched his book earlier in this series. And he clearly says, and he uses Bangladesh as an example of a success story, despite its problems with corruption. He says it's critical that, that we ha enter into elite bargains. If we're going to get development, if we're going to get climate change investment, how do we harness and agree with the elites in the various countries that we have to deal with um, to bargain with them to actually progress and develop along a more less inequality and more climate friendly approach? So I'm interested in what you do because I look at your index. I don't see a chapter on elite bargaining and I'd like your thoughts on that. Okay, let's take one more. Uh... Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm an MPhil student in uh, development studies, and I suppose my question is more on behalf of, I guess, the, the young people who are about to start a job or look for a future career in development. Um, and I was sort of wondering, when thinking about these problems and thinking about 2060 and where the world might be, uh, how we should think about our careers and the trade-offs between joining academia or joining more of the multilateral organizations or private finance com companies in solving these issues such as inequality and uh, climate change. Thank you. Okay, let's start with those three. Then I'll go online. Um, so I do see we've got some questions and then we'll come back to, to the room for the next run. If you can keep your, this is reasonably short, we'll have time for more rounds. Sure. Uh, <laughs> the elite bargains question. question. Uh, I think Stefan's right. I mean, in throughout our careers, um, we've had to make that sort of bargain, if you like, with elites about how to persuade them essentially to uh, do things which may in the short term look uh, to be against their personal interest, their political interest, but in the longer term is certainly in the national interest probably and probably in the global interest. And uh, I actually wrote something about this during lockdown because uh, I felt my whole capacity to do elite bargains with leaders of these middle income countries that my bank was serving was um, actually constrained because uh, what that requires is the conversation face-to-face 
as to why this is in the interest of that elite to move in this direction. And I think you have to point to a lot of things that um, are changing those countries, which often elites are not aware of. Uh, but research will show in younger people, young people, for example, voters who are coming through, they're looking for quite different things uh, from their elites in future. And to the extent that they, this matters to some of those elites, in some countries it doesn't matter because, frankly, the votes are weighed, not counted. Um, you know, this is something that they uh, do understand more of. Or if you link it to things like national security threats, climate, climate change, take the war question of water in the whole of Central Asia. So often I used to get into conversations with leaders in Central Asia around water because they saw that as a sort of competitive problem between the countries. And that's why they should try and tackle it together, uh, those sorts of things. And climate was often, uh, I tried to address those sort of issues in these conversations with elites in that, exactly that way. Why it would be in their national interest to do so? Why that would also help with the short-term support from many of the people who are actually losing their livelihoods because of lack of failure to tackle those sort of issues around the Aral Sea or whatever you can talk about. So elite bargains is something that we need to address. And that's at national level or regional level, but potentially also international level. Why should, you know, because we're worried, I think, seeing the segment, segmentation, the US-China segmentation you've seen in the multilateral system. How are we going to get the, those two elites, those two countries, to actually address uh, each other on some shared interests? And I think the multilateral system could do that, the G20 could do that. Particularly, as I think Montag is right, the next three G20 presidencies is a real opportunity for doing that. Uh, but I bet you the meeting in Jakarta will be all about whether Putin is attending or not attending, and not about the, the sort of issues. Um, if you want to take the middle income class question. I missed, uh, what are the exact formulation that you want to be to Abid? pick up? Oh. Is it becoming even more dif difficult for late, late developers to escape the middle income trap because of the cost, like, you know, uh, for transition to Ukraine, uh, which South Korea and others uh, developers did not have to face? So. No, I, I don't think it's becoming more difficult. The thing is, the world's more complex. And I think in those days, uh, the world was opening up and there were only a few countries with either good sense or good luck or whatever it is to follow an open strategy. And there was a very easy strategy to, I don't mean to minimize the success, but it was relatively easier to follow that approach. Um, the world has become more complex and therefore the whole, the nature of the middle income trap, so-called, I mean, is more institutional. Uh, the kinds of things that you're now expected to put in place are vastly more complex than what, say, uh, the Republic of Korea had to put in place. That was much more efficiency-oriented, get the job done, et cetera. Today, global governance, corporate governance, all kinds of things. I don't think it's more difficult. I think there, there needs to be clarity on the part of the political leadership. What is it that they're really going to do? And I think the real danger, I'm, I'm afraid, and this comes out in the international sphere also, is that, you know, clarity comes when you define some things as critical. Clarity does not come if you define everything as important. And my sort of reaction to a lot of the international discussion on sustainable development goals, there is not a single worthwhile thought in human development that isn't somewhere or the mm -hmm. other not pegged onto something called a sustainable development goal. This makes leaders sort of pay homage to it, but most of them don't understand what the hell it's all about. So frankly, I think there's some merit in saying, all that's important, but the next 20 years we must fix climate change. I think they would very easily be able to agree on certain things. It takes a lot of political uh, mileage to address opposition uh, to, uh, you know, sensible policies directed in, 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 a, in the right direction. But if they're kind of having to follow multiple objectives, then the uh, political leaders will basically mount the slogans and do nothing. You know, uh, that's my feeling. So it's not, more diff it's not more difficult in one sense, but it's more complex in another sense. So if I can add a couple of words to what Montek said, which is very correct, by the way. I've written a bit on middle income trap myself. 
and we look, we compared South Korea and South Africa and Brazil, why South Korea succeeded while South Africa and Brazil, for example, did not. And there is one basic lesson, which is institutions, in addition to a lot of other things, outward looking, competition, et cetera. The key was institutions. Do countries build institutions in advance? What institutional structures are necessary in advance? And they do improve them. And that's the key. That was the single most important thing. And that's, I think, what Bangladesh needs to give. Not today, what institutions would need next year, two years, five years ahead. Your question, and you know, Montague and I joined the World Bank a couple of years after Montague I did. We joined as young professionals. When the bank hired young professionals, bright people, not me, him, right? And you went up the system. But it also joined people, hired people like Ian with experience in certain sectors experts, super bright people. My suggestion to you would be consider multilateral institutions as a career, but do something before that, something practical. Go and work in some country, some area, come back with experience, three, four years of experience. Whether it's climate change or inequality, practical experience, and then you'll have a wonderful career. Don't think you'll spend 30 years, 40 years in a multilateral institution. Spend 10 years, 15 years, contribute, and go and do something different. So the thing you should do before you join the Young Professional Program of the World Bank is you should become an ODI fellow, which, <laughs> right. is, which is what I did um, immediately after university at Oxford. And so that's, that, that gives you the applied experience because you'll be working in an emerging market developing country government uh, as a young economist or statistician. Um, and for two years, and many of those ODI fellows then go on to become YPs in, in the World Bank. Or EBRD. Or even EBRD. Some of them come to EBRD. So. The only thing I would add to that is that you now what you have to do is work hard because 33,000 33, people apply for the World Bank Young Professional Program and about 30 get it. So <laughs> it's tough. Um, and that's true of ODI fellows as mm -hmm. well, very intense competition, not 5%, but um, don't beat up on yourself if you don't get it. There's lots of other things in development uh, to do. And the main thing is, I think, to be passionate and to keep keep working on it. Um, and that, Brett, let's take some questions that have come online. Uh, so this is um, a simple one, perhaps for you, Harinda. Please define emerging markets. Um, <laughs> is India an emerging market? Uh, one from uh, is, uh, this is also for whoever wants to ask, or maybe for you, Harinda. Uh, the three basic issues, shouldn't productivity um, be the first one addressed so that you get the growth to be able to address the others. Is there a sequencing? Uh, and um, there's a question on the potential for climate change induced food and water shortages in it destabilizing the models. Maybe for you, Montek, uh, what the potential is for that to disrupt everything. And then a question from Sarah Crow, who I know. Hi, Sarah. Nice to know you online. In real time, events are so profoundly changing. Scenarios don't uh, take into account big changes, such as the changes we're seeing now with the war in Ukraine, um, the COVAX rollout, et cetera. How does one take account of these big changes uh, in trying to think long term? Well, very good question. Let me take the first two and then one take probably one to take the climate <laughs> change issue. And then we'll come back to the last question. Uh, emerging markets, uh, the way we define, we started with a relatively narrow uh, definition long ago, which was which markets the private sector is interested in. And uh, that was the initial definition some 30 years ago. It was coined by some of my colleagues from IFC, your colleagues also, Ian. And then when we started Emerging Markets Forum, we felt that we need to go beyond what private sector was interested in. We defined as 
countries which had promise of development, um, where there was scope for countries to converge with developed countries, which are now defined as advanced countries, as OECD and IMF define. There was a scope for convergence in relatively near future, next 20, 30 years. And we are defining now 30 years. Most of our work is for the next generation or two. And this is how 2060 comes in. And we define countries like China and India definitely as emerging markets. Uh, there is a bit of a stretch when you look at uh, sub saharan Africa, because it has countries like Niger, Mali, and we are not defining that as emerging markets at the moment. A lot, there are a lot of failed states as the World Bank defines, um, and we are not defining that as, as emerging markets. So by my definition, the way we are, which is a bit of a loose definition, I admit, uh, we have something like 120 countries in the world who are emerging markets. There are 36 countries that advance, and then you can calculate that of the 196 countries or so in the world, rest are not yet emerging markets. So this is the way um, we are defining that. Um, now, in terms of the second question was, if you remind me for a minute. Where the proximity needs to come, change needs to come before the others, so you have resources to do them. Well, productivity at the end is a bottom line. If you, you know, develop a simple model, Kof Douglas model, with three factors which ultimately define economic development, not social development, which are demographics, labor, capital, and total factor productivity. And demographics, which is labor, is relatively stable in terms of projections. You can't change it uh, dramatically. Um, Capital investment, yes, you can change it a little bit, but, but that also doesn't change dramatically. A lot of weight, roughly two thirds of total growth in most countries accounted for by total factor productivity, which is admittedly residual. But that's a lever you can push much more with policy changes. And but even though there's a lot of debate how to do it, and your paper everybody should read if I can advertise that. <laughs> um, however, what happens with climate change will have a big, big impact. And it's a big issue. I think the whole planet could collapse unless that issue is tackled. And that's why I started with that. Inequality is equally important, not only in economic growth terms, but also social and political. But the reason I ended by talking about productivity is that the biggest lever in our model in terms of growth terms particularly if you use that in terms of a 30 year time period, the biggest difference between optimistic and pessimistic scenario is productivity. But within that is the issue of climate change. So you, you have to factor that. It's very difficult in terms of quantitative modeling to, to quantify the impact of climate change action or inaction on that one. But in sheer economic terms, to the extent you can do modeling, uh, total factor productivity is the dominant factor. Motik, do you want to comment on the climate, food, water? Uh, yeah, but can I add something on emerging markets? Mm -hmm. it's nice. I think Vanak Mile, whom you probably know mm -hmm. in the IFC, first coined the phrase. And I'd asked him, why did you coin this phrase, emerging markets? And he said, you know, we're, we're responding to a situation where an in investor class had emerged in uh, Western capital markets, willing to invest in stock markets in what were then called developing countries. And he said, look, if you go to a bunch of investors and say invest in developing countries, it's bad marketing. It doesn't sound right. Whereas if you say these are emerging markets, it sort of conjures up visions of you know, rising stock prices. So it's a straight PR term, it's a good term. Since then, of course, it has become virtually every developing country that isn't a failed state is just called an emerging market country. But I think there's some merit. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a developing country. I think there's some merit in restricting the term emerging markets to countries that have opened the capital market 
and investors are sort of welcome to come in. And certainly China, India are in that category, many others are. But anyway, uh, the IMF has a definition of emerging markets, which virtually includes uh, all countries except those that have serious problems. You know, on the water issue, uh, there's no question. Uh, that climate change will affect many things, but we know that what it is going to do is is going to alter both the level of precipitation and more importantly, the variability of precipitation. Funnily enough, for the first 20, 30 years or so, the actual level of precipitation may increase because you can get a lot of glacier melt and uh, whatever that does to rainfall and so on. But the variability will increase. You will have many more extreme weather events. Now, that poses real problems for conserving water. I mean, the easiest kind of rainfall situation to manage is the one in Britain, where you have a reasonable amount of rain, and it falls virtually through, <laughs> through the year, uh, so it can soak into the ground. Amongst the worst is India, where we actually have a reasonable amount of rain, but it all falls in two and a half months of the year. Now, just imagine from our point of view, if that two and a half months become one month, and this has happened in the sense that uh, cities like Mumbai have experienced precipitation uh, four or five times what they were used to traditionally for a particular year. You know what that does for urban drainage systems? I mean, you would have to plan for a drainage system that can deal with a much larger amount of potential water falling at any one time. And if you think about that, that's a humongous investment to make in the whole city. So frankly, a lot of what needs to be done is actually the same as how to deal with water scarcity. I mean, we have I mean, afforestation, a lot of the kind of ways of irrigating uh, things, the earlier approach that you should uh, build dams is giving way to other forms of water management which are actually potentially very productive, but they've never been, they've never received the attention that they deserve. So I think that's a big area where in relatively uh, limited amount of time, over a period of five to 10 years, if there was a change in policy, uh, but the most important thing about the change in policy is the money which currently goes to construction of dams should be shifted to smaller things, check dams, afforestation, et cetera, et cetera. But if you did that, I think the feedback, I mean, the response would be tremendous. Lots of uh, micro evidence in India that where communities have done that, uh, the payoff has been huge. So it's a, it's a very important area. Just one other question. Isn't there? Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is going to... Um, in the crises. Yeah, um, and I'm going to ask you another question that's come up. Uh, <laughs> well, should I have a go at that? We, 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 I'm going to ask, I mean, here, the question on, on responding to Christ, but, but this is something also that maybe you can think, the trade-offs between these different priorities. Uh, how do, you know, you, you sort of, you were advocating that we wish that the multilateral bank shouldn't trade them off, let's just focus on climate. Uh, but um, how does one weigh up the needs of inequality, of education, uh, of climate, and others? Well, um, you know, there was an old adage to govern is to choose. Um, and uh, my fear is actually many governments don't choose. And we all see that in the, I think, in the G20 as well. We have this, as Montek said, you know, with the SDGs or whatever, you have this sort of Christmas tree approach uh, to these issues. Um, and I think underlying both those questions is a leadership problem. So when we had the last major financial crisis, uh, there was a G20 leadership, I think. I mean, Obama and Gordon Brown certainly led it, but it was a G20 consensus on how to tackle it. And it was a, a successful uh, approach. We've had two crises very close to each other. One of, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, and then more recently, the invasion of Ukraine, which is, I think, a bit of a global crisis because it's so, uh, you know, obviously breaking apart alliances. Uh, and I think we are not seeing that sort of leadership anymore. Um, that's why I wish Montek well for what he's saying on the G20, that maybe the next three G20 presidencies can do something. But I think the G20 has rather burned itself out uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, let's hope they can rejuvenate. 
it's that leadership of the G20 where I think these trade-offs should be being made. I mean, I'm in a camp with one take on climate, probably being the top priority, right? For our generation, our kids as well. But that's not something they've decided in the G20 leadership yet. Uh, that's what they should be pushed for, for towards. And that requires one or two conductors of the orchestra <laughs> to, to play that role, to show that leadership. Um, and it would be nice to think that maybe on one issue, maybe climate, the US and China could actually come together and show that leadership. They've got to find some common causes, and this is one I think they, they could find. Let me just get a sense of how many more questions there are. Okay, a few. <laughs> um, let, let, let's go back to the room, and um, if we don't get to everyone, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the, let's start over here, Elizabeth, um, with this little cluster of three. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm an MNC and incoming DPhil student in sociology, and um, so if you've identified three urgent issues for us, and they are climate change, inequality, and productivity. And so I feel that inequality is actually the core concern of sociologists, but I just feel that uh, sociologists uh, are trying so hard, but they are not making a very uh, a profound, um, uh, it, uh, sorry, influence on the world, like uh, those maybe uh, policymakers and those people working in the World Bank. So my question is actually related to this question of your advice on job opportunities for young people. So uh, if we choose the academia path, if we choose to become uh, academics, scholars, and researchers, uh, what would you think that we can do to help contribute to this urgent issues for us? Um, remember these questions because I'm going to try and capture them all because that's all we're going to have time for and keep your questions short and then we'll hopefully have time for all of them. Um, yeah, the person next to you. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I'm Doruk. I'm a PhD student in chemistry. Um, I was wondering, um, so a lot of resources are being um, depleted quite fast and this includes formerly very abundant resources like phosphorus as well. And um, in terms of sustainable de development, um, how do you see the impact of this on the emerging markets? And are we are we um, focusing too much on trendy topics and maybe um, um, overlooking some of the more obscure but yet important problems uh, that might be way too important in the let's say in the next thirty years, in the next fifty years? Thank you. Very interesting question. First in front of you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the talk. My name is Arnav. I'm studying for an MSc in law and finance. My question is to do with um, sort of the alignment of incentives of the of world leaders. And there was a mention of how some Western countries and their voters, the younger generation especially, has started has started recognizing climate issues uh, while making the the decision of who to vote for. Um, but this is, I feel, visibly absent in the emerging markets so and elections are obviously the clearest way to align the incentives of politicians to issues like climate change so how do we then align the incentives of the leaders of the emerging markets with distant issues like climate change and as a corollary to that question can multilateralism be an answer to that, especially from a perspective of finance, where, um, for example, loans can be linked to sustainability targets by um, these world organizations? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, tough question. Let's try and just take the other, the remaining two, is it? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, my name is Shivani. I'm a master's student uh, in law and finance. Um, maybe a slightly naive question, but uh, uh, I mean, given the amount of financing required for climate change, uh, what are your views on the role that the private sector has to pay, play? And uh, at some level, is there a requirement for a realignment of the profit motive uh, for, for the private sector? And how do you sort of go about achieving that? Okay. Final question. Uh, thank you. I'm Goro. I'm doing a DPhil in Transport Studies at School of Geography. Uh, I was I wanted to ask you about the transition to renewable energy in India. And one, do you see the recent uh, climatic events such as the heat wave to disrupt this transition or India's prospects for transition to RE 
in the short to medium term because that led to a power shortage and the whole who how over coal and so on in the states and so on and at a more much more wider level how do you equate india's prospects for renewable energy transition with some of the moves that have been made in past years recently such as the privatization of coal mines and the much documented india's stubbornness to not uh, sign on to phasing away of coal and so on Okay, should we start, um, member of the should we start at the end <laughs> with, with you, Montek, maybe? Can you formulate the question you want me to answer? Because there's different... Yes, let's, let's just overlapping. start with, with India and the severe heat wave and shortage and privatization of coal mines and whether that's going to lead to... What about coal mines? The... Privatization. Ah. Um, whether that's going to lead to a dilution of achievement of climate objectives no the the heat wave i'm assuming the heat wave is part of the kind of climate change that we've all been predicting i'm not an expert on it but it driving home uh, the fact that we've got to do something okay i'm not sure how privatization of coal mines matters in this context but quite honestly if we're going to achieve the objectives that we have ourselves set then Frankly, we have to just phase out coal. And my own guess would be that if you go to the private sector and say that, you know, we're going to phase out coal, uh, how about you setting up a coal mine? The chances are they're not, not going to be very interested in doing it. They might be willing to buy up a public sector coal mine in the belief that they can exploit it during the period that coal is still being used more efficiently. But frankly, the, it's politically very difficult to privatize something which is currently in the public sector. I think uh, the important thing about coal, coal mines in India is that everybody concerned should be uh, aware that coal mines are going to get phased out. You know, we were criticized a lot in Glasgow because we didn't want to say something like there was a debate about whether we should be phasing out or phasing down. Both China and India were quite willing to phase down but not phase out. But these are matters of detail. I mean, the, it's unambiguous. Either we give up uh, the mitigation uh, commitment that we've made, or we have to assume that by 2050, the total production of coal in India would have to be much less than what it is now. We've got five minutes left um, to answer all these questions. <laughs> Rinda, uh, choose and pick, and I'll leave it to Suma to mop, mop up the rest. <laughs> so, let, let me take the first question. Um, because we talk quite a lot about climate. I think it's very important. It's well covered. But I do feel inequality is a big issue. So I want to come to your question. First, I'll commend you and others to read the chapter on inequality. Um, I think it's a thoughtful paper. But I want to stay, start by saying that three years ago at G7 meeting in Biarritz, all seven leaders, heads of states, um, adopted a paper which we had something to do with and promised that they'll do something very proactive to lift the bottom 40% in their countries. And guess what? Even though they unanimously agreed, nothing happened. G7 countries. And inequality increased in most of the G7 countries, even though all seven leaders of G7 countries signed off that they were directing their governments to do something about it. It's a very difficult issues. And not only G7 countries, inequality is rising, it's rising in China, India, Brazil, Nigeria, South Africa, you name it. And the paper, the, ch the chapter discusses that. The multilateral institutions, whether it's World Bank, African Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, Inter-American Development Banks, they all say they're going to tackle inequality, as someone said. And despite all that, 
not much is happening at the country level. The reason is we pronounce policy level, but not the curve is not reversing. It's not bending. Much of what needs to be done is at the country level. It's not the global level. Our paper, the chapter, has a long list of actions which are necessary. But the real solution is leadership in the country's mouth a lot of actions, but actions are not really taken. I think the real solution is young people, civic groups have to say this has to stop and actual actions have to be taken. And they start with- Harinder, we only have two minutes and I want to give Susan yeah. about to, to answer three questions. So do read the <laughs> chapter. I think it's a thoughtful chapter. So um, thank you very much. I mean, the, these are all very tough questions. I mean, are we overlooking certain topics? I feel I could give you the Donald Rumsfeld answer. If I knew, I'd be a very rich man. But, um, uh, you know, yes, in your own area, I think rare earth um, minerals is a sort of a neglected area, for example. A lot of these natural resource issues uh, are neglected still, and phosphorus being another one. So, um, yeah, for sure. I think MDB loans and sustainability targets, if you look at the multilateral development bank loans, increasingly they do have quite a lot of sustainability targets. But they're always um, up against it because to negotiate those sustainability type targets at project level uh, takes more time because you're trying to persuade, let's say, a private sector entrepreneur to invest more in certain technology and to prove that there's going to be a quick payback. Uh, it's got easier because the technology has become better and cheaper. So the you know uh, renewable energy being a classic point, it's now very you know much easier to convince countries and uh, entrepreneurs to do that sort of thing. Uh, for sure. Uh, the role of the private sector in climate change is enormous, absolutely. I mean, you know, you have to engage with the private sector because the manufacturers and others at that level. And so the multilateral institutions, I think whether it's EBRD or IFC in the, in the World Bank, institutions that focus on the private sector, they need to actually scale up even more than some others, I think. And it can leverage and bring in private sector players. Sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, all of these uh, put, potential sources of finance actually also work with the private sector. So for sure, that's that's a big agenda ahead, I think, of us. Um, Frank, that's all we have time Good. for. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for coming. Thanks for all of you online. Um, this is being recorded and will be available if you want to share with others. Uh, we'll go back over it. And particularly thanks to, to our panelists. Um, it really is a pleasure to, to have you here. I'm sorry that the time hasn't done justice to the depth uh, and wealth of information you have. There are very few questions on development that you don't have a deep, deep experience on, uh, but it's been a treat to, to have you here. And do, I encourage you all to get the book. I see there's still quite a few behind there. I know people have been stepping up and, and getting some. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Hirinda has kindly made available to those that if we do run out, uh, that he'll send some more. So uh, that's really uh, a tremendous opportunity. It's not often at book launches that you get given free books. I'm trying to recall when we last did that. So um, this is the new way of doing things, the externality of ideas which are embedded um, in that. So thank you so much and um, good sun shining. And maybe there are occasional afternoons in England when it doesn't rain. <laughs> but thanks to you all for being here. Thank you.